Hey, how's it going? This is Chad Haig reporting from Southern India. Welcome to another Western philosophy short in which we try to cut to the chase regarding what is the main point of some debate within the history of Western philosophy. In this case, we'll be revisiting the critique of Husserlian phenomenology as presented especially in Jacques Derrida's early works like Speech and Phenomenon, as well as um, the Genesis and Structure essay of this book, Writing and Difference. Now, this is a uh, part of Derrida's work, which was extremely significant. A lot of his really early writings were just about this deconstruction of Husserlian phenomenology, and yet it's largely neglected, I think, in favor of more accessible works like of grammatology, which is really his critique of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, um, simply being so much easier to understand than this sort of work because a lot of the difficulty of his critique of Husserl stems from the difficulty of phenomenology itself, which is um, among the most um, complicated of all things done within Western philosophy. But for that very reason, I think this is something which has to be discussed um, today within this short. And really, the big problem for um, Derrida with regard to Husserl's theory of science as presented within theological investigations is that his distinction between the two basic types of signs as being expressions on one hand and indications on the other um, leads to a certain conundrum within communication which he can only resolve by appealing to a notion of presence which basically betrays a kind of metaphysical presupposition within phenomenology which is undone within itself. Now that might sound like a mouthful but it really will make sense if you consider that uh, for Husserl in the first logical investigation the two kinds of signs are distinguished on grounds of whether they have a meaning or they don't. A sign with a meaning he calls an expression, not because, as you might think, it expresses the thought of one mind through language so another mind can access the same thought, which is really more like an Aristotelian idea for Husserl as working within phenomenology explicitly. What is expressed as a meaning by such a sign is the speaker's intention of a certain object. Intention in this case not meaning a desire, but rather um, the technical sense of the term intentionality as being directed as consciousness towards some object um, out there in the world. And what you express with that sign with meaning is just that part of the world. That part of the world is lit up when you are using a sign to talk about it. And this is to be contrasted with those signs that do not have a meaning because they don't light up any particular intended part or piece of the world, but they still are able to indicate on a very brute level things like, say, a gunshot um, at the beginning of a horse race is an indication that the race is beginning. Um, a whistle during a football game is an indication that the play has to stop because the referees are um, uh, throwing the yellow flag, is it, um, for some sort of foul or violation of the rules. And also Husserl's own example of um, smoke is an indication that there's a fire, so long as we don't overthink that into some sort of cause-effect relation. It's not that the one thing is a cause and the other is an effect. It's rather that we have within the relation of indication, only the most brute relation of association. Once again, that gunshot is associated with the start of the race, but there's no meaning beyond that brute association. The problem for Husserlian phenomenology, as identified by Derrida himself, is that language is significant because it occurs not in a vacuum um, in which these two can be so cleanly separated, but rather within actual communication, which uh, takes place between thinking minds. And in communication, even if one mind is using a sign with a meaning, which is to say an expression, which is to say something that expresses an intention that lights up some piece of the world, um, there is still something of a contamination or an intrusion of a sign without meaning even in that act. Because I am expressing that sign with meaning to you, another mind, you in the process of communication are also getting an indication of the act of thinking as taking place within me itself. And so too, uh, 
when the other speaker speaks, there is an indication that thinking is going on within that mind, even if that indication is simply the brute association without a meaning. So the real criteria to separate these two, according to Derrida, is the criteria of presence itself. There's something of an inverse relation in Husserlian uh, theory of signs uh, between presence and indication in the sense that the speaker um, cannot indicate to himself that he is thinking, for there would not be any need to do so. He doesn't have to indirectly indicate that because the thinking is already fully present to him himself. He needs a sign to indicate the thinking of the other because that thought process, if you will, is not present to him because it's in someone else's mind. So we can clearly distinguish really the uh, level of um, meaning based on how much presence is involved, can't we? A sign uh, with no meaning really is just a euphemism for one with no access to presence. But what happens when you have a speaking to oneself, even if it is merely an as-if operation, as Derrida would call it, if I speak to myself by saying, you know, what you did was wrong, you shouldn't have done that. I'm not really speaking to myself. Rather, I'm engaging in a sort of active representation. I'm merely representing it as though it were the case, and therefore falling out of true language into a sort of fictional language for all of the reasons we have just mentioned. However, this clear-cut distinction between real communication, or another way of saying it, real language versus the mere imitation thereof, can only make sense if we cling to a presupposition within Husserlian phenomenology, which actually is purely metaphysical, despite the irony that one of the conditions for phenomenology to take place as a method, according to Husserl himself, is that we put out of use all of our metaphysical presuppositions, especially as um, clearly delineated within a work like Ideas One. Husserl notes that in phenomenology, we're not trying to add anything extra beyond what is already appearing within consciousness. Rather, we can only only allow what is already appearing within consciousness to appear the right way so that we can actually understand it if we subtract something from that, which is the kind of presuppositions we have as operating within what he calls the natural attitude, which cause a certain distortion and misinterpretation of those same contents for metaphysical reasons. Now that might sound like a mouthful, but to put this very, very simply, the natural attitude assumes that not only are things appearing within my consciousness, but they're appearing to me as a particular body situated within an extended world filled with all of these other bodies, because the subject here is specifically interpreted as a body situated within that sort of naturalized world, it's inevitably going to lead me to overthink what appears by clinging to certain subtle metaphysical presuppositions, rather than simply allow phenomenological analysis to sort out what is unessential or merely factual, merely empirical from what is really essential, a priori, and pure within intuition. I can, for example, um, see this not just as a blue um, non-smartphone, but rather through a dropping the natural attitude which posits such a distinction between subject and object um, as two bodies within an extended world, I can actually through so many counterexamples with other objects like this, um, find what can no longer be counterexampled, what really holds true for both of these on a pure, a priori, and essential level is that as physical objects, both of these things have the essence of appearing only in partial perspectives one at a time. I cannot see all sides of this phone at the same time, for that's the whole point. As a physical object, I can only see one perspective at a time, so too with this book. So for Husserl, um, the only way you can get to those essences is if you drop the metaphysical presuppositions, which would otherwise le lead you to get lost in so many pseudo-problems. But the irony for Derrida is this distinction between real language and the imitation thereof on grounds of the distinction between signs with a meaning called expressions and signs with no meaning called indications relies on another metaphysics, which is that of presence itself. The idea is that I can't have the kind of communication which relies on this indicative layer um, 
gesturing towards the thought of the other, the fact that the other is thinking, but not as something self-present to me. I can only rely on that if I assume that my own thought process is fully self-present, because I'm fully present to myself. But the presence of the present is itself not anything like the kind of secure foundation of being which Husserl might otherwise assume, as demonstrated by his own writings. Derrida notes that the funny thing about the present um, within temporal terms is that even for Husserl, the present is not anything like a metaphysics of being qua, being in and of itself. Rather, the present is already always already broken up. It's always already split by non-presence, because the only way to account for the flow of time within Husserl's later writings on internal time consciousness, the only way to account for our ability to hear a melody as a melody rather than a set of separate notes, to hear a flow of the melody itself is to account for the way that presence is always constituted on an ongoing manner by things that are not present. You have a protension and a retention that allows the no longer present past and the anticipation of what has not yet really arrived within the future. It's still merely an anticipation. Those are always there with the present, allowing it to be constituted, not on an occasional or intentional level, um, something I only choose once in a while to do, but it's always going on on a kind of unconscious and automatic level because these are conditions for the flow of time through the present itself to take place. And therefore, the present for Husserl is not anything like the kind of metaphysical foundation he would assume it's already been deconstructed from within. Another major problem with Husserl's understanding of presence as something of a de facto definition of being in and of itself is that this requires another distinction to be maintained, which also falls apart upon closer scrutiny. And this is the, the distinction between the two senses of the word ego. For Husserl, the funny thing about following through with the phenomenological reduction is that it leads you to a number of different regions of material ontology, as he calls it within the ideas. So there are different kinds of things which appear within consciousness um, in the sense that um, rather than just differing from one another on empirical grounds, like, you know, this is a phone and this is a book, um, they differ from one another in terms of the very kind of being that they're emerging from, which leads us to discover a set of different regions which do not make up a tree with a single trunk and so many branches, but rather more like metaphorically a set of different mountain peaks. And one of these is uh, physical objects, but another one is a kind of discovery of the ego, which itself is to be distinguished from another. You can discover the empirical ego as one of these things which can be manifested within consciousness, but that's not the same as the much more mysterious transcendental ego, for the empirical ego has to be constituted first by this other more primordial transcendental ego. The transcendental ego is kind of the ultimate Archie region in which all of the other things appear. I can only access any one of these because I have already taken for granted that the transcendental ego is kind of the um, foundation which is accounting for the constitution of all these other things. However, the distinction between these two types of egos actually doesn't rely on any truly positive criteria which is discovered, but rather on the simple negative and mysterious idea of a difference. Well, what can you uh, cite as the evidence separating the merely empirical ego discovered within consciousness from the transcendental ego, which is the foundation of consciousness itself? Actually, the only thing I can list is the purely negative difference between the two, which has to be posited once again, simply to uphold the metaphysical presupposition that presence is the definition of being, which means the self-presence of that transcendental ego to itself. But without that metaphysical presupposition, I suddenly lose not only presence, but also the very distinction between these two senses of ego.
However, Derrida notes himself that the only way you can try to unify these two different senses of ego, for which the only thing we can say about them being different is the purely negative difference in itself which disrupts them, a difference in itself which cannot be named, known, or described any further than that because it is simply a difference. Well, the only way you can try to unify these two senses of ego back into a unity once again is through absorbing both of them into this mysterious higher notion of life. But what is life in this context really except just another euphemism for presence, which has always already been split up by its own criteria to be situated within time. This is something which is further explicated in the early essay uh, within this book, Writing Indifference uh, on Genesis and Structure, by the uh, way that what time flows into, what it is open to is a better way to put it, um, is uh, something within the future which can only really be the future if it's totally new. And if it's the truly new eruption of the future into the present, then it must be an intrusion of the infinite into that which would seem otherwise to be limited in the precisely structuralist sense of thinking about language um, as a uh, closed systematic totality. This is how Saussure was tempted to think of language when he set up the distinction between long and parole, French words for long as language, obviously, and parole as word, the distinction between um, the kind of word which literally comes out of somebody's mouth when they speak a language, like all of the millions of speakers of American English today, that's parole, the thing that comes out of their mouth, but the language that American English really is, in and of itself, is not reducible to any of those parole. It's rather the pure long, which can be a language even if nobody speaks it. We use the example of dead languages like Latin, but even better, let's talk about Tocharian, the extinct, um, mysterious Indo-European language from Western China, which um, some theorize split off from the Proto-Indo-European branch before any of the others, because by the time we get Tocharian writings in, say, the 9th century, um, the varieties of Tocharian are as different from each other as Germanic and Romance languages are today, and let alone how different they are from the other Indo-European languages. So a truly dead language like Tocharian um, is still a language despite the fact that nobody today speaks it as Pachol. It can be a language because Long is the purely abstract system ultimately for um, so sort of differences. The funny thing about language is we can't positively know what any symbol means in and of itself. We can only know negatively that one symbol within a language is different from another. And it's this negative differentiation of one symbol from another, which generates meaning as its retroactive effect is kind of how this would be described later in psychoanalysis by someone like Slavoj Žižek within the symbolic order. Well, within Sosur, you have an attempt to treat language as a closed totality and a system which cannot be disrupted by the flow of time because it is not the kind of language that is spoken as Pachol within the mundane world, but the Criterion for Husserl to subordinate, to ground all of language within presence runs into the problem that if the present really is flowing within time, it has to be open to that which is, by definition, infinite, because it's open to a kind of future which only is a future if it's really new. This is like the third synthesis within Deleuze's difference in repetition. The third synthesis gives you difference in itself through its opening to the future, and this becomes a big deal within accelerationism. So for Derrida, the dream of treating language as a closed totality of purely abstract differences as basically still grounded for Husserl's theory within a metaphysics of presence falls apart because the present is itself split open by the eruption of the infinite into it through passing into the future. However, for Derrida, it is not only the future which comes in to deconstruct presence and self-consciousness from within its own coordinates, rather it is even the ability of intentionality itself which performs a similar deconstruction, as he notes brilliantly within this book, Writing Indifference, that essay on Genesis and Structure, he notes that consciousness is able to have access to all of these different regions. Once again, we have the region of physical, spatial, temporal objects. Then we have the region of psychic acts. We have a region of 
the pure transcendental ego. We have uh, the region of, say, uh, how laws are given, things like that. We have access to these different regions because the objective correlate of experience itself called the noema is not in and of itself something that belongs to any one of those regions. It is rather the thing through which the different regions can appear through their surrogate objects because the noema is once again a regional, having no intrinsic region to it, but that's exactly what allows it to work the way that it's supposed to. So the noema doesn't belong to any of the regions of the objects it allows us access to, but it also doesn't belong to consciousness because it's just the objective correlate which appears within consciousness without being an actual part of it, which allows the mysterious relation of intentionality to work. My consciousness can actually be directed towards something on the outside only because the noema as the objective correlate allows it to do so. But what does this really mean? Except that there is something within consciousness which belongs neither to it nor to the object which cannot be described except negatively as the same sort of opening which at the end of the day simply deconstructs presence from within in much the same way that the eruption of the future into the present does the same thing. The more we scrutinize the foundations of phenomenology, like intentionality and the flow of time, the more we find that there's not anything like a secure uh, ordering of presence as being in and of itself. Rather, the more we scrutinize the f these foundations, the more we find things that are just dissolving that hope for full presence within the same sort of criteria which Husserl himself had delineated. We don't have to add anything extra to what Husserl had already envisioned. That's already undoing itself from within. For the noema at the end of the day is simply another mysterious opening that dissolves any dream of a closed systematic totality and along with it dissolves the very distinction for Husserl between real language, which has no indication because it's fully self-present, and false language, which merely seems to do what real language would do, but without the kind of metaphysical foundation ultimately going back to presence.